Hello everyone, this is Wojciech SP5 WWP from the M17 project and today I would like to show you my OpenHT proof of concept that I have built with uh, a few things that I had just laying around. So let's get started. So let's start from the from the basement source and I'm using module 17 running OpenRTX as the basement source and I've got a Baofeng uh, microphone speaker connect connected to it and uh, of course when I press the PTT button uh, the board starts generating basement so normally uh, the output from the board is just zero, zero volts it's AC coupled and it's of course powered by uh, a power bank with a nice logo and then uh, the basement goes to a, a small breadboard with just two resistors and the purpose of that is that we need uh, a DC bias voltage for the ADC of the micro uh, so that's the that's the DC component and so before sampling the signal with an ADC uh, inside this micro we need to add half of the power supply uh, DC bias voltage to the baseband. So uh, those two resistors do exactly that. And then uh, we sample the signal, the baseband, using an STM32 micro. And uh, we send the baseband samples to an FPGA. And then uh, from the FPGA we send the IQ stream uh, to the RF uh, RF chip, which is AT eighty six RF two one five by Atmel slash microchip. So I've got a scope probe connected to the basement basement output of the module seventeen. Then uh, I also have a digital probe with uh, two channels connected connected to uh, SPI output to the RF board so we can see what's going on there so the principle of operation is pretty simple we generate the baseband and the output is pretty much analog because it's filtered it's low pass filtered so we've got an STM32 running OpenRTX and uh, using one of the DAC channels we generate the baseband and it's uh, low pass filtered and presented at the, the E9 connector. Then we've got a DC component added to that and this signal is sampled by the STM32. Uh, the resolution for the ADC is 12 bits, so that's decent. We sample the signal at 48,000 kilohertz 48 kilohertz sorry and that signal uh, sampled goes to the FPGA and the FPGA itself does one very important thing uh, it runs an NCO that's numerically controlled oscillator that is being tuned by the exactly by the baseband that is sampled by this micro so uh, if the baseband sample is zero, so in our case it's half of the supply voltage, the NCO uh, sees a tuning word equal to zero, so there is no frequency change. And if the baseband goes up in voltage or down in voltage, the NCO uh, tunes accordingly. So the FPGA does actually two things. Uh, for the AT86, before we are, we are able to use it, we have to initialize it. So the STM32 uh, sends the initial. <laughs> so the STM32 uh, sends an init sequence to the AT86 through the FPGA. So the first part is just uh, a bypass. So the FPGA doesn't do anything anything uh, important and then after the init sequence is done uh, the AT86 chip is ready to transmit and it actually transmits a carrier wave a continuous carrier wave 
unmodulated. And then uh, the FPGA changes its operation to uh, generating baseband based on the baseband samples that are provided by the STM32. So the STM32 uh, provides baseband samples that are real valued, I would say. So the FPGA does conversion to an IQ stream. And the while the baseband samples uh, from the module 17 are 12 bits and real valued, uh, the IQ outputs of the FPGA are 7 bits for each signal. So this is not a lot and this is because we are using the AT86 in its debug mode. So normally you would use those SATA connectors to connect to an FPGA like this or something else to stream or source uh, the basement samples, both I and Q branches and in our case we are using SPI which is very slow considerably slower compared to the LVDS uh, transmission that is used uh, with the SATA cables that we would normally use but for the proof of concept uh, purposes we are using uh, SPI so uh, the STM32 sends the init sequence to the AT86 then the FPGA kicks in and then sends baseband samples to the AT86. And those baseband samples are sourced from the STM32 and STM takes, it, takes them from the module 17. And so module 17 is connected to the STM32 using pure analog way, <laughs> so we've got just a bunch of wires with an analog signal, but then uh, after this point uh, we've got totally digital signals. So the analog baseband after reaching the STM32 uh, gets converted to digital domain and uh, the analog part is only between module 17 and the STM32. So everything uh, that is after STM32 is just digital. Uh, and in our case it's SPI pretty much everywhere between the STM32 and the FPGA and the FPGA and the RF chip. Next, we've got the IQ samples going to the AT86. If there is no modulation, just like right now, uh, because the module 17 is turned off, uh, there is no baseband, I mean it's just constant zero volts. Uh, there is just a carrier wave uh, transmitted by the AT86. So let's try and connect. That's right. Alright, so the module 17 is running. Now we have to set it to the correct output level. All the way up to 256. Two five six. Okay. The call sign is set to SP five WWP. The CAN is set to zero. Now, uh, if I press the PTT button, we should see that SDR plus plus is trying to decode the signal, and you can see the baseband on scope. So the transmission is ongoing, and and that's it. We've got the the source SP five WWP. The destination is set to. Uh, broadcast. Data type is of course voice as it's a stream and the count is zero. There is an interesting artifact visible in the spectrum right now. Uh, as we sample the signal at 48 kilohertz there are some images that uh, appear in the spectrum on the left hand side and on the right hand side and those will not be present in the uh, OpenHD because we are going to use much higher uh, sampling rates and uh, those images will not be present as the uh, AT86 filters them out of course that happens at higher uh, sample rates, not at 48k so that's it
All right, so maybe I should also tell you what the FPGA does in more detail because I'm uh, just saying that it passes SPI data from the STM32 to the RF chip is not enough. So uh, let's go from the from the back side. So in the FPGA we've got an SPI uh, multiplexer that is used to route the signal. So uh, when the when this device is turned on, we would like to see we'd like to set the AT86 to transmit mode. And to do that, we need a pretty long init sequence and uh, the init sequence is uh, stored in the microcontroller so we don't have to use FPGA to do it so we use the uh, STM32 to generate the init stream through the SPI and then we set uh, we set exactly this pin to zero Okay, so if we want to uh, transfer data from the STM32 to the AT86 chip, we have to set this uh, this net to zero. And if you want to uh, tell the FPGA to start doing its work, its heavy lifting, uh, we need to set this uh, this line to high, and that tells the FPGA to use this transmitter instead of uh, the one in the microcontroller. Uh, so those lines go directly to the AT86 chip. Then we've got the uh, SPI transmitter within the FPGA. And then this is the important part. Uh, we've got an SPI receiver that takes baseband samples and those are 16 bits if I remember correctly. Those samples are received over SPI and then uh, passed to the frequency modulator. And that modulator uses uh, sine and cosine tables to output I and Q signals based on the modulation input. And it's all clocked by a global clock of 12 MHz. Then we've got an IQQ and this basically does one thing. It converts the I and Q uh, data stream into something that can be read by th that can be read by the RF chip. So it sends the address of the I and Q registers that are used for the I and Q modulation. And that data is being sent to the transmitter and goes to the AT86 chip. And that's it. Okay, so see you later guys.